I'm Chaplain Jacob Scott of the Oregon National Guard. This is the Hope in the Trenches podcast. We're going forward. I'll sit down for conversations with people who offer interesting and informative perspectives on finding strength for life and work in the trenches and even improving our spiritual posture. Whether you feel like you're under heavy bombardment or ready to go over the top toward a new objective, it's good to be with you. Our guests today are Sergeant Eamon O'Reilly and Radar, a canine team and supervisor in the patrol division with the Washington County Sheriff's Office. Eamon's been married to his wife, Lisa, for 28 years, and they have four fantastic children. He was first hired by the jail division in 2004 before joining the patrol division in 2008. He's been a member of the Washington County Interagency SWAT team, or TNT, the Tactical Negotiations Team, since 2012. Sergeant O'Reilly is the 99th person to pass probation and become a member of the team since it was founded in 1976. He promoted a corporal in 2014, followed by sergeant in 2016. He joined the K-9 team in 2015 and was paired with Radar, a Belgian Malinois, when Radar was one year old. And Radar just turned 10 on New Year's Eve. And I should have asked, too, uh, in the military, the dog is one grade higher than the handler. They do that in police work, too? We don't. We don't yeah. give dogs ranks, no. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so recently, Sergeant O'Reilly and Radar exploded in popularity on social media as their short videos that are released almost daily show them sharing and rating a snack in the cruiser. You guys do such an incredible job making people smile and, and bringing some positivity. So we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in a bit. My co-host today is Chaplain Shane Yates, our deputy state chaplain here in Oregon. This is his third time on Hope in the Trenches. Shane became a chaplain in 2007 after a career in law enforcement. He has held a variety of assignments as a chaplain, including with the the CAV, infantry, field artillery, engineers, and aviation at battalion and brigade level, and now alongside me here at, at Joint Force Headquarters. Shane's deployed to Baghdad, Iraq, and Kabul, Afghanistan. And on the civilian side, Shane is CEO and co-founder of Task Force Heroes Ministries, serving first responders and veterans nationwide by providing spiritual resiliency and hope as they face the dangers and trauma of their frontline careers. Shane and his wife, Karen, have been married for 30 years. They have five children and multiple grandchildren. And two of his sons have served in the military, and one son and a daughter uh, currently serve in law enforcement as well. Our producer is First Sergeant Zach Holden, a public affairs specialist for the Oregon Guard and our 115th Mobile Public Affairs Detachment. Eamon uh, and Shane, thank, thank you so much for uh, for joining us today. Yes, yeah, sir. Thanks for having me. No problem. Yeah, so Eamon, you shared with us uh, that you're a Navy brat. So yeah. how did how did you grow up, and and when did you become interested in serving in law enforcement? So my dad served uh, 20 years. He retired a commander, okay. uh, and as an officer, it, uh, he he basically got to choose a lot of the places we moved. We still moved every two or three years, mm-hmm. but we stayed in California the whole time. Okay. So I just moved up and down the coast of, oh, of California, Oxnard, Monterey, San Diego, uh, and then. He retired in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. <clears throat> so that's where I was uh, most of my uh, junior high, high school life. Um, not always on bases. That was the only base I lived uh, lived on, Hamilton Air Force Base. Okay. I was decommissioned Air Force Base at the time, but still uh, uh, housing for uh, current military. So we lived there, grew up there. And my experience with military kids is there's two kinds of military kids. There's the kids who grow up wearing their dad's fatigues and play in Army. And then there's me and my buddies who were skate, you know, we skateboard and wanted nothing to do with the military, (laughs) which, uh, and now I actually regret because I, I think I would have had uh, a good time. I think I would have been successful and enjoyed, uh, any of the services, any of the branches, but, uh, wanted nothing to do with it when, when it was time to make the decision. Um, and, and I actually also wanted nothing to do with law enforcement. Not that I wanted, I wasn't trying to avoid it, Mm -hmm. but it just wasn't on my mind. Sure, sure. Uh, I was basically in the restaurant industry for most of uh, my young adult life, uh, making minimum wage and and barely scraping by. And my dad, who had been working for the government, continued to work for the government when he retired, mostly city governments. He He was an accountant. And so he was looking for a job for me and sent me a message, told me that uh, Washington County, where, where I was living at the time, uh, we moved up here. My wife and I moved up here when we got married, moved up to Oregon in, in 95, just to get away from California. We couldn't afford it, really. Yeah. 
And so he sent me a message and said that Washington County was hiring dispatchers. And I thought that sounded terrible. That sounded like an awful job. But it took me to the website that showed me that they were hiring police officers as well. And I still remember to this day, uh, we were living in a, in a, in a town home with uh, two stories. And I walked down the stairs and I got halfway down the stairway. And my wife was watching TV, back was to me on the couch. And I said, hey, what do you think about me being a cop? And I expected her to turn around and laugh. But I think she was so frustrated with me not having a career at the time that I, I could have said anything and she would have encouraged me to do it. <laughs> and she turned around and she said, yeah, that, that sounds great. You should do that. And so I said, okay. And I applied and I started working for Washington County Sheriff's Office in the, in the, in the jail in corrections. So I had, no, I had no aspirations for law enforcement. I hadn't even been in the jail yet when I got hired to work in the jail. So absolutely zero aspirations for working in law enforcement. So do you or, or your wife have any family members in law enforcement? No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So no, that's a brand no, new world. It was a brand new world for us both. Yeah. 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 Well, that's a, I mean, that's a, that's a big commitment. Did your, did your wife understand the commitment that she was making? No, neither of us, yeah. neither of us understood the commitment. She, yeah. like I said, we, we were, you know, we were living paycheck to paycheck and she, I could have said anything and she would have supported me. <laughs> yeah. So, and she's supported yeah. me since, but it was definitely, uh, it was a new, it was a new adventure for both of us. Okay. Well, and then, uh, did you get, did you have dogs growing up or how did you, then when did, uh, canine become it, uh, an option for you? It, it, it's a very similar story in that I, I didn't have any aspirations in becoming a canine handler. We had a dog when I was a kid. But it was, you know, I don't even know if I would consider it a dog. It was this little tiny thing. It was a Pekingese poodle, mm -hmm. little white thing named Chester that I, I didn't care about it. He was just a little dog. It just happened to live in the house that I lived yeah. in. And my wife and I didn't have any dogs. Um, I actually didn't like dogs. I wasn't a fan of dogs. I wasn't a fan of animals in general, but I definitely was not a fan of dogs. Um, but I liked problem solving and I liked, and I liked puzzles. And I loved to see the canine team use their dogs mm -hmm. to solve problems. And so initially, I just went to work with the team because I thought, who better than to have, uh, try to have a dog bite than a guy who doesn't care for dogs and, and dogs don't like? Because I just thought dogs didn't like me, but it was really, you know, a relationship where they could understand that I wasn't comfortable around them. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, what, what better person to go hide from the dogs and get in the dog suit than, than a guy that doesn't like dogs. So I went to help the team, which now I tell people all the time, if you want to be on the canine team, that's the best way to get in there is just to get to meet the team and understand yeah. how they work with the yeah. dogs. And, yeah. and so by, by nature of just going to help them out, I started to really become interested in what they were doing with the dogs. Mm -hmm. And so when a position opened up, uh, I applied for it and, and got the position still thinking that it was just a tool. It was just a thing that was going to be in my car that I was going to be able to get out and use yeah. to, to solve problems with. So now are, are you, are you like a checklist guy or a routine type person? Because yes. that's a, that, that's a big deal with, I mean, mil military law enforcement in general, but when you're training uh, a canine. That's, that's really important, isn't it? Yeah. It, routine is important. Checklist is important. What the, I think one of the more important things that I've learned since being on the canine, cause I've been on the team for nine years now. Um, radar has been the only dog that I trained personally, but in that nine years, uh, and then moving into the supervision of the team, I've had the opportunity to help train all of the dogs on my team, as well as, uh, we, you know, we train with everyone from the whole state twice a year we get together to train. And so I've had opportunities to train with other dogs. So routine is really important, but what, what is, what's more important is being able to think outside of the box mm -hmm. and be able to think in terms of, um, uh, it, 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 just to be creative is, is pretty important, mm -hmm. but, but I am a routine. I'm very yeah. big on routine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And dogs like routine, right? I mean, a, do a, a dog loves a, a, a routine. They can get used to it. They learn, I think they learn better. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. 
Yeah. And I shared with you uh, in 2015, when we were in Afghanistan, I had a dog who had been trained to be a service dog, uh, but was, we some would say remissioned to, to come with us as a, as a therapy dog. And he, he had, had learned in training over 90 different commands. And so quite frequently I learned when he wasn't doing what I wanted him to do, it was because I was not yeah. giving him the commands correctly or in a way that he understood or putting right. him in a, putting him in a position to be successful. Yeah, we, we, we've learned that dogs are actually much more uh, smarter than we think they are. And some breeds more than others. Sure. But they're, oh, yeah. much, they're much smarter than we think we, than they are. Then, and, and the, the, the game or the process that we've learned is trying, it's not that the dog can't understand what we're trying to say. It's just, we're trying to, how do we communicate that in their language? Mm -hmm. Because we can't use the, you know, people think we, you know, that dogs speak English or dogs speak German, but all they're doing is they're hearing tones and they're hearing, you know, they're hearing fluctuations. Correct. And yeah, so they're, they're, they're not understanding the language. So when I'm trying right. to teach a dog how to do something, I have to figure out how do I get the idea in my head to become the same idea in the talk. Right. Right. And right. so that's, that's one of the puzzles that I enjoy doing. Right. Yeah. And, and reinforce that, uh, the, the stimulus and response. Yes. Right? So, uh, but it sounds like you learned something about that human animal connection too, right? I, I mean, I've had more than one veteran tell me that their, their dog saved their life when they were at a particularly dark, dark time. Uh, and, and we were talking about this before we started recording when we were in Afghanistan and Finnegan was there with me, I had several people tell me that they missed their dogs more than most people that were back in the States. Um, so tell me about that bond then that's developed with radar. Yeah. So the, the bond evolved. Uh, because like I said, when I first got him, he was just a tool that I thought was going to go in the back of my car and I was going to get him out when I needed him and I mm -hmm. was going to put him away when I didn't need him. And that's really did start that way. Yeah. That's how it, that's how it started. Um, and it was a, it was a pretty frustrating first year because not only was he my first police dog, he was my first dog dog. Yeah. I mean, not including Chester when I was nine. Yeah. This is my first dog. And so I had a lot to learn. He had a lot to learn and I had a lot to learn. And we did, we made a lot of mistakes. And so that first year was really frustrating. Uh, but once we got over those hurdles and once I started understanding how to convey ideas to the dog, then I could start, you know, I could start petting or playing. We didn't play a lot just because it was, mm -hmm. I was just trying to teach him how to be a police dog. Sure. Uh, so once we started uh, building uh, that, relationship then then the bond started with uh just becoming uh he became my friend because it became you know it's time to come with me in the car and he just became a part of who i was mm -hmm. and learning that he was just goofy uh he's goofy he's a silly dog and uh he would much prefer uh he would much prefer to play than he would to do police work and so once I started to understand more about his personality, then it was easy to become, uh, to become, uh, for that, for that bond yeah. to grow. Yeah. Does, does, uh, that come out then when he's at home, like with your kids? Yeah. Well, yes and no. Um, he's an outdoor dog. He doesn't live in the house. Okay. Uh, our policy is, and most, most in the Pacific Northwest, our policy is the dogs don't live in the house. When dogs are in the house, it's, we want them to know that if they're in a house, they're working. So okay. we don't want them to get comfortable mm -hmm. sitting on a couch or, you know, watching TV so. or sitting on a dog bed. If they're in the house, right. they're looking for a person um, and they're not a pet. And we don't want them to, we, we want them to be friendly enough that I don't have to worry about him, you know, snapping mm -hmm. at somebody while we're walking down the street. But I also don't want him comfortable enough to know, you know, to go up to people to get pet. Sure. Uh, and so they, they, he lives outside uh, in the garage if it's too hot or too cold, but mostly he lives outside. So he didn't really interact with my family a lot. My kids are grown now. Mm -hmm. They're all out of the house. And so it's just my wife and I in, in the house. Uh, they all, he's, they, they've built up enough relationship with him that they trust him. That none of, none of them are, you know, he doesn't have the same bond with any of them but they trust him. So if I say like, if I'm gonna be gone for three or four days, I can have my family watch him and they know that they can let him out and he's not gonna bite people. You know, yeah. he's not gonna bite them. Yeah. They can let him out, they can feed him and they can put him away, but uh, he's not a cuddly dog. Uh, yeah. So the Malinois, what's the nickname? The fur missile, fur right? Missile, yeah. Right. Yeah. Mal Malagator right. is, yeah. is yeah. one of my favorites, but yeah. yeah, so he's not, he's not a cuddly dog, uh, but the family, 
trusts him. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And I think that's a misnomer, right? I mean, I think a lot of people see the dogs and they think of them as pets, but that's that's not the case when it comes to mm-hmm. police canines. Yeah, no, exactly. I, 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 I have to explain to people that, that see that I have an outdoor kennel for him or that I have a garage right. crate for him, right. that he's, he's content. Sure, That's, sure. He's, he's content living there yeah. and, and he's a tool. He's not a pet. He's, right. he's, he's got a, a mission. He's a, he's a department owned right. tool that just happens to have fur and paws, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. he has a job to That's do. Right. Yep. And, and, you know, he doesn't get to have toys. He doesn't get to, right. he, my particular dog just, he doesn't get a, a fluffy bed because he destroys it. So, <laughs> but he, he doesn't have all the he doesn't right. have all the the toys and features that a that a pet would have. Right, he's, right. He's, he's, right. A, he's a tool. Right. So what what motivates him is he is it food motivated? He's or actually toy him, driven. Toy driven. Yeah, okay. he's toy driven. Um, <clears throat> despite what um, his my, my account my Instagram account would show you that he loves food. He absolutely loves food, but he's toy driven. Um, one of the first times when we were, when I was training him and we were teaching him to alert on human odor, it was one of the first times out in just a, a parking lot where I let him go to go alert on a box or to go search a box that a human was hiding in. And when he alerted on that box, he, he got his reward with the time was just a tennis ball and he ran away. <laughs> and so I had to, it took me uh, probably 20, 25 minutes to get him back. And as soon as I got him back, my trainer said, all right, let's do it again. And I said, he just ran away. It just took me 25 minutes to get him back. And his trainer said, well, that's up to you to figure out how to get him back. Yeah. And it took several trainings to figure out it was a squeaky toy. Anything that squeaks yeah. is his, it's, it's his favorite thing in the world. So mm. I have a squeaky toy. It's embarrassing as a police officer uh, <laughs> and to, to go to training or even in the real world. Um, I remember the, one of the first uh, SWAT encounters we had and he captured, he captured a guy hiding under a bed and I had to call him back to me. I'm with a bunch of squat guys and I just pull out the little toy and it's, <laughs> you know, that's, that's what, that's what brings him back to me because that's what right. he wants. So right. he absolutely, sure. he's very toy driven. Sure. Well, that's, I think that's one of Murphy's laws. If it, if it looks stupid, but it works, it isn't yeah. stupid. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Again, we're thankful for you, man. And, and everything that you're doing, um, just the mission and, and the things you face and, uh, you're a blessing to, to so many people that, uh, I think at times we don't even realize how mm-hmm. much of a blessing Thank you. That, that you are. So, mm-hmm. uh, you've been serving now, Sergeant, for 20 years, um, we run into Chaplain Scott and I uh, run into a lot of soldiers and airmen that um, desire to serve in that field. They ask a lot of questions about law enforcement, and there's, you know, there is that crossover paramilitary, military, and and so we get a lot of questions and a lot of desire from some of these young young men and women. Um, thinking in, you know, kind of from your career perspective, what are some of those lessons you've learned um, that you could maybe share with some of those young? Uh, military service members, uh, uh, who are, who are looking to maybe get into that career. So the thing I, I tell people, I, I tell my kids, I've been telling my kids this for years and I try not to sound condescending, but it's really just the, the number one thing is to just make good decisions in life. You mm-hmm. make good decisions, mm-hmm. then you set yourself up for the opportunities in the future for, for, for good opportunities in mm-hmm. the future. And so just making, making mm-hmm. good decisions is, is the key. But also following your passions and mm-hmm. pursuing your passions. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people think that, I mean, the military is a great place to, to learn skills and get experiences, like you said, that, uh, that apply to law enforcement. Mm-hmm. But I think even the military has opportunity to pursue particular passions, to mm-hmm. pursue your passions, and then outside of the military to pursue your passions. You don't have to go from... You don't have to graduate high school and go into college to get a criminal justice degree. It's just not necessary. You can, I mean, you absolutely can do that if that's the, if that's the route you want to go to get in law enforcement. But we take all sorts of people Mm -hmm. and we have places in law enforcement and in Washington County, Washington County is the, um, it's the third largest agency in the state of Oregon. It's the second most populous County. So we have a lot of options. We have a lot of special teams. Uh, and we have a lot of collateral duties. And so we love people that bring 
their own experiences to sure. us. We don't we sure. don't need people who grew up with military dads or with right. police sure. you know, enforcement in their right. in sure. their family. So whatever people are passionate about, sure. we'll teach you all the law enforcement stuff. Sure. Mm -hmm. We'll teach you how to shoot yep. guns and the laws and how to drive and all that sure. kind of stuff. So, but we love when people bring their passions to us. Yeah. You know, it could be it could be silly like math. Right. Like maybe you're a math whiz and you love math. Well, we you know we've got places for that. Yep. we've got places where that's appropriate. Yep. Um, like me, you could like. I mean, I didn't like dogs, but maybe you come into it loving loving animals. Uh, that we've got places for people who love animals. People like to ride motorcycles. We've sure. got options for that, you know? So just, I, I just suggest that people uh, follow their, what, what makes them passionate. Yeah, that's great. No, that's, yeah. We embrace that that's in great. the National Guard too, with the, the, in the reserve components as a, uh, compared to the active duty, mm -hmm. because most of the men and women that serve in the Guard are not, yeah, in a military uniform full time. Right. So they bring a lot of different skills mm -hmm. and attributes and different perspectives and just having that diversity of thought and diversity mm -hmm. of approach can be, yeah. really, can be a really powerful. Uh, and all those skill player. sets too, that, that uh, varying skill sets and, and natural gifts and talents and all those things contribute to a diverse force. Yes. And, and, uh, and I know we, we've, yeah, we, we think highly of that. That's a, that's a definitely a blessing for us yeah. too. I work with a, we work with a couple of reserve, uh, probably more than I can think of that I know of, but specifically a couple that I know of, um, the current, uh, team leader for our SWAT team is, is in the reserve. And one of our, uh, our, we have an airplane, uh, for the, the sheriff's office and our pilots are reserve. So mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, that's fantastic. Good, good. Well, that's, so one of the key distinctives of the National Guard is our role in supporting domestic operations. And so lo local law enforcement agencies are some of our key partners for training and response to emergencies or natural disasters. And, and we, something I didn't know until I'd already been in the Guard for a while, we have National Guard soldiers and airmen who work counter drug operations with uh, local law enforcement agencies. Have you worked or trained with the, the Oregon Guard before? We've trained with them. Uh, my SWAT team has trained with them. And for that purpose, like if we could, we, we haven't found yet the nexus, the, the drug nexus to actually partner with them on, on a live operation. Mm -hmm. But we have found that ability to train with them. And uh, it was, we had a good time. We, uh, it was, believe in the, the base was down in Salem or near Salem. We went and we flew in the Lakotas. Um, and it was just our opportunity to learn how to uh, learn how to get in, strap in, you know, learn about weight distribution yeah. and just about how to safely climb in and climb out. But as for me and, and my partner, uh, my other, uh, one of the canine partners, we got to put the dogs on and off. And so we got to jump on the Lakotas with, with the dogs and get off the Lakotas with the dogs. We basically just took off, flew around and landed for hours, just repeatedly getting on yeah. the helicopters and getting sure. off the helicopters. Sure. So we, we had a blast for us. It was, a, I mean, it was, it was good training. We learned a lot, uh, but we haven't had the opportunity to, to partner for a live operation. Sure. How'd radar do on the helicopter? Um, he's great. Once he's on the helicopter, <laughs> yeah. Once he's on, he's yeah. he. The overpressure of walking under the rotors yes. really bothers him, and so the first five or six times we did just fine. You know, he he hesitated a little bit as soon as we got under the rotors. He knew that jumping into the helicopter would eliminate most of that overpressure, so he was good getting into it. Once we were on it, he was great. Wanted to look out the windows. You know, dogs aren't the smartest, so we had to we had to keep him on the leash to make sure he didn't yeah. jump out. Yeah, uh, but he he had a good time. Uh, but by the time we had done it like nine or 10 times, I had to carry him. I couldn't, he wouldn't walk. He wouldn't <laughs> voluntarily get onto the helicopter yeah. anymore. Yeah. I've seen that before. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We laugh, we laugh. And Shane saw this too. Cause when Finnegan was with me in Afghanistan, yeah. uh, he was fine if helicopters were, sure. were flying around or even taxiing. Cause right. yeah. we were, we were at the Kabul international airport. Right. Uh, and, but, and he'd been, uh, What's the what's the right word? They'd had him around helicopters to desensitize. Desensitized. Sure, yeah. yeah. So he'd been uh, around helicopters before, but yeah, as as soon as we would we'd start to walk up, it was usually a Chinook, and they've got yeah. uh, the exhaust coming out the back. Right. As soon as he felt the exhaust and he knew we were getting on, he would put the brakes on. And so there's some great pictures yeah. of me carrying yeah. carrying a 75 pound lab yeah. on I the remember. back of a helicopter. Yeah. We and then yeah. and then yeah, then once he's on, he'd he'd sit down. He was he was good, but then he also learned to. As soon as he'd hear all the seatbelts click off and the ramp was down, he was ready to leave. He's ready, ready to, to go. Yeah. yeah we, we have a Chinook experience as well, but the 
when we were learning about the Chinook and we were going for a ride, the Chinook was, it was quiet. It, it wasn't on yet. So we got to walk up the ramp and take our seat before they turned it on. Okay. But as soon as they turned it on and he heard it whining. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, the Chinooks have those bubble windows and mm -hmm. he was over my shoulder trying to get out that bubble window. Mm. Oh, and yeah. as soon as we took off, we, we, I think we went for, they, we, we were out of Camp Rylea and they just took off and took us around the coast a little bit. And I think it was about a 40 fit of five minute ride. But as soon, as soon as we got in the air, radar just evacuated his bowels on the floor of the Chinook oh. and it just ruined the flight for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as soon as we landed, I was like, all right, I'm going to go put him up and I'm going to come running back and clean it up. And I realized that they, didn't have time. So we just got off the helicopter and they flew away. And I felt so oh, bad because no. he just left <laughs> yeah, it yeah. all left over the, the floor oh, of the show. Right. Oh, right. yeah. So we're not, we're not allowed in helicopters anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure they'd love to see your radar. Yeah. Let's see if we'd make that happen. So, um, well, maybe we'll, we'll shift gears a little bit. Uh, cause we really, one of the, the big things that we talk about and try to share with our soldiers and airmen, uh, we, is resiliency and how people build and develop re resiliency and physical fitness is an obviously important part of serving in the military and law enforcement too. Can, can you talk about maybe your understanding of, uh, holistic health and fitness where physical fitness fits and, and what else do you do to stay fit for duty? So for it, having been in this for 20 years, my understanding is, has evolved. A mm -hmm. lot because oh, yeah. when, when I when I first started, there wasn't a lot of emphasis on on holistic health, <laughs> right? And it Not was the military either. Yeah, I bet yeah. Uh, it was just come to work. You know, a lot of us new guys working working graveyard, working overnight, working overtime, uh, and the the allure of of being able to work overtime and make up make more money. Um, it was just come to work and work as much as you can go home mm -hmm. and, and recover however you recover, which ends up being alcohol for a lot of people, mm -hmm. um, and come back to work. And so over the years, we've realized that, that fitness, mental, mentally fit and physically fit, keeping people healthy, uh, it's not just good for them and good for their families. It's, it's good for the sheriff's office. It's good for law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And so the, the important, it, it's become much more important. And some people, um, do a better job of, of seeking that out. Uh, and I ended up turning to strictly to physical fitness was mm -hmm. really where, uh, where I went, um, not really mental fitness, uh, until probably about 10 years ago, I, I started realizing that, uh, expanding my, uh, expanding my, my mind was very helpful. Uh, but I, I turned to physical fitness. I run a lot. Uh, I haven't, have never really been a huge into, into lifting weights. I've been, I, I started building my own gym, uh, last year so that I could start lifting weights mm -hmm. as well. Uh, just understanding the importance of, of being physically and mentally strong. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I've always, uh, it's, it's always been running for me, but I started learning, uh, that I lived inside of this little bubble, this little, this law enforcement bubble or inside, well, I had a couple of bubbles that I lived inside. I lived inside this law enforcement bubble, but I also lived inside this Christian church bubble. And so I sort of had this echo chamber that I lived in. And so, uh, it, it, it was easy to, it was easy to stay in there and just feel like that that was the place that, uh, made me comfortable, feel mm -hmm. comfortable. So actually getting outside of my comfort zone and talking with people who had different beliefs mm -hmm. and finding people who lived, had different lifestyles than me to learn and understand that maybe I didn't have all the answers. And we've started making that important or, or we've started trying to let officers know that that's, that's important, that, that mental resiliency as mm -hmm. well as physical resiliency mm -hmm. is what's going to keep you healthy, physically and mentally healthy for an entire career. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts too. And Shane, you can weigh in, but then having having that healthy spiritual, mental, and emotional core to handle what you deal with on a daily, uh, a frequent basis yeah. in law enforcement. Yeah. It's easy. It's easy to get discouraged. 
doing what I do because we most of what we see is we see people on their worst at their worst times mm -hmm. and on the worst at their worst moments, not just the you know the person committing the crime, but the person who's had a crime committed against them is also yeah. having a yeah. terrible day, yeah. and they're not at their best, uh, and so it's easy to be discouraged and it's easy to go home and start to think that that's how everyone is all the time. Mm -hmm. And if you don't put yourself in a position to see people at their best or to read people about, about people while they're at their best, it's easy to get discouraged. Mm -hmm. So for me, like we talked about, I'm a big runner, the running community for me, just the community itself, the running is great. I, I enjoy running. I just, yeah. I, I like the physical challenge. Um, of of running and about pushing myself to run diff, uh, further or to run faster or whatever. I, I enjoy that for me, the challenge, but the community is different than anything else that I'm a part of. It's just such a, a, a welcoming, loving, positive community yeah. yep. that, that that for me is a place that I can go mm -hmm. uh, to be revived mm -hmm. and, and to find, you know, to find hope. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we, we encourage people uh, to, to find that sort of a community outside of law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Cause we, we, even if law enforcement, we're positive, we can be positive people, but if you're, if you know, if it's five or six of us getting together, it's going to go, it's going to, we're going to start talking about work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we're going to talk right. to, we're going to, it's healthy. I think it's a healthy environment. You have to be able to let off some steam and that's yeah. a good place to let some steam off. But in letting that steam off with those with those right. buddies you're hanging out with, we're not really uplifting. <laughs> it can turn dark. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah, it can turn dark. It can turn dark right. pretty fast. So right. uh, we, we encourage people to find something outside uh, of, of law enforcement and outside of that bubble to, yeah. to find hope. Right. Now, when you run, uh, some people talk about, you know, contemplating the meaning of life and deep thoughts and more philosophical thoughts while they're running. I'm just thinking about breathing and how my feet are. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what, yeah. <laughs> right. but, and yeah, you, I, I can think, um, I, I get thoughts. I, I solve problems mm -hmm. often. I solve my own problems generally when I'm out running, but, uh, I try, I try to occupy my brain when I'm running just so that it doesn't hurt because yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm usually trying to push myself in some fashion, either I'm running faster than I want to run or I'm running further than I want to run. And so something hurts. Yeah. And so and we're at that age too. Yeah, sometimes. probably. Yeah, sometimes that's it. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I, I try to occupy my mind. I'm not a I'm not a silent runner. I can't run with nothing in my ears. Okay. So, yeah. uh, but I so I like to listen to books generally. But, All right. Uh, but I, I like to listen to fiction because I find myself when I'm listening to nonfiction or if I'm listening to a podcast, I sort of have to pay attention to understand the process. Yeah. But if I'm listening to fiction, I can if I'm not if I realize I haven't been paying attention for a minute or two. I still understand the story yeah. and I, and I haven't missed anything. So I'm a fiction book, uh, podcast or fiction book runner. Okay. Oh, very mm -hmm. cool. Well, uh, what's, uh, well, if that brings up a debate that I've enjoyed having with people for a while, if you it, listen it's to reading. a book, I consider it reading. Yeah, 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 I know where you're going. Okay. I know exactly. where you're going with that. <laughs> I consider it reading a book. If you, I, I do too, yes. for the record. Yeah. Yes. There are, there are definitely benefits to seeing words on a page. I think there are, um, I think they're better for it's better for understanding syntax and vocabulary and for learning things. Mm -hmm. But it, I'm not I'm not that picky. If you want to say you read a book, if you listen to it, I'm fine. I, that's what I say. I think so too. Yeah, and people absorb information in some sure, different yeah. ways. Sure, yeah. sure, uh, sure. Well, and I I heard that you qualified to run the Boston Marathon again this year. I did. So that's yeah. that's that's quite an achievement. Yeah, tell, tell us about that process. Well, so when I, I started running, really when I joined the uh, patrol in, in 2008, just to get healthy and to stay healthy. And I'm, I'm the type of person that doesn't like to see that someone else can do a physical activity that I can't. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm just by nature of my size, there are a lot of things that I can't do that yeah. other people can do physically, but I can run. And I realized I could run. And so I started running 5Ks, which is you know where a lot of people start. And I go to the 5K and I realize that there are some people running 10Ks. And so I was like, well, I guess I should run, I could run a 10K. If that guy can run a 10K, I could run a 10K. And then I find out there's running half marathons. And then, you know, it's not like I'd never heard of a marathon, but when I see people running the marathon, I think, well, I could, I could run the marathon. And so I start running marathons. And then I realize that there are, even in the running community, even running marathons, there are other goals. There's goals that not just finishing a marathon, but there's, 
you know, there's the, there's the, the elusive Boston qualifying time and it the seems BQ. to be, yeah, yeah, it seems to be everyone's calling it a BQ and I want to know what a BQ is. And then I find out it means you ran a, a time that qualifies you to register for the Boston marathon. And so I thought, well, you know what, I can do that. So in, in 2016, that uh, was my first marathon, the Portland marathon. And I set a goal before I even ran that marathon, before I ran my first marathon, I said, I, I bet I can, I bet I can qualify for the Boston marathon within five years. And so I, it took me uh, just under four. So in just under oh, four years, yeah. I'd, I'd qualified for the marathon. So, yeah, that's impressive. Well, and so that'll, that'll be coming up in April. Um, what was, what, well, what was the experience like that first time? The first time was, it was unique. It, it's a very unique marathon just among marathons because it, it has a lot of it, it, the the start it's it's a point to point course um and you have to get to the you got to bust out to the starting line hours like three or four hours before the marathon starts and they've got a village that you hang out and so it's just the whole process was was uh filled me with anxiety because i'd never experienced mm -hmm. it and so but i had a, i had a great time my wife is uh my, my wife uh is very supportive. She's not a runner, but she travels with me to run. We, we travel a lot just so I can go run somewhere, but we usually pick somewhere that we, that was also interesting for her to visit. So sure. we, we spent the first, I think we were there for five or six days and we spent three or four days before the marathon, just being tourists. So I must've walked, you know, 15 miles just around the city before right. we yeah. even went to the marathon. And, but she, you know, she'll go to the, uh, she'll go to the expos with me and, and some of the, some of the stores with me. And, uh, she, she supports me by going to the stuff that she doesn't think is very interesting, but she hangs out with me. And we have a yeah. good time. So it was the yeah. whole experience was, was, it was a blast it, enough that I want to go do it again. Yeah. My, my, my wife has been dragged along to those expos yeah. and things like that too. A couple of years in, she said, I didn't think running could be so expensive, yeah. yes. uh, but <laughs> well, we were talking about something before we started recording and, and with respect to physical fitness and, and you made the point that, um, simplicity and consistency, uh, go a long way. I mean, that's true of running. You can make running pretty complicated, sure. but we used to say in the army, look, uh, there's, there's no secret to the, to the PT test. Uh, you just do a lot of push ups, do a lot of sit ups mm -hmm. and run really fast. Mm -hmm. And the only way to get better at running is to run. Mm -hmm. um, you can make it complicated, mm -hmm. but simplicity and consistency mm -hmm. go, a go a long way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shane, you had a you had a question about because we we talk about well in the military we've got five pillars of resiliency mm -hmm. uh, the physical the spiritual emotional um, but then there's there's also the social and the family and you touched on kind of the the social part of, of running too but Shane mm -hmm. you had a great question about family resiliency and kind of how how that can help us yeah and I think you kind of touched on it it was actually really good you, you know these are healthy coping mechanisms right running and and being with family and spending time with, you, you kind of alluded to it, spending time with those that are not in law enforcement mm -hmm. is always super healthy. Because you're right, it goes right back to war stories. And, and then pretty soon you're talking about some caper that happened way back when. And so so being around people that that uh, whether they're from a social group or, a, you know, the, the running team, the running group, anything outside of work is always healthy too. But I was just kind of curious uh, for your kind of your your family fitness or your family resiliency and your spiritual resiliency. What do you do um, personally that some young uh, law enforcement officer or even a military person could could hear you say today that that might help them in in their careers? So for us, it's just spending time, time. spending time together, yep. and and I've I've been in the career long enough that I I have made major changes in how I spend time with my family. Sure. And I made a lot of mistakes when I first started and my kids, my kids weren't quite as young as uh, a lot of the new officers are. I mean, I guess, I guess they were pretty young. They're 20. So I'm, I've been in the 20, my, my youngest is 20. So she had just been born. Um, and so they were, they were, I guess they were pretty young, but I spent a lot of time thinking that my job was to just make the money. Mm -hmm. and and go to work and make the money and my sure. wife's job was to take the kids to practice or to take the kids to their games mm -hmm. take the kids to this and that and i missed i missed a lot of my family's activities when they were young because i was working mm -hmm. and because i i i had put work as a higher priority than my family mm -hmm. and i've spent the last probably 
I, I estimate probably five or six years, maybe seven years trying to fix that. Mm. Uh, and thankfully my wife was so good with the kids that I didn't ruin them. Um, sure. I just, <laughs> I, I don't have right. as good a relationship with them as, as I wish I did. Uh, but I've been, I've been making, uh, a big effort uh, to, to change that sure. and to mm -hmm. show them how important they are to me. But uh, that's, that's, that's what it was. It was spending time, just yeah. spending time with them doing things that they enjoy doing. Yep. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. It was easy to do things that I enjoy doing. Cause I sure. look back, we did, if, if, you know, if you scroll through my Facebook photos or whatever, you can see us doing a lot of stuff, but it's always stuff that I wanted to do. Right. You know, it's like, oh, look, you guys, you guys went hiking and you guys right. oh, look at you went to this waterfall and you do right. that. And it's all, yeah, it's great. But it was all me. Like I wanted right. to go hiking. So I brought my kids and, right. and my, I probably wanted to go hiking. So I took my wife or camping right. or whatever. So, um, but it's just about finding out what, what is important to them and doing that with them. But it's just, it's just spending time. Sure. It's, it's yeah. time. Yeah. It's time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's so easy to get carried away with, with work, work, yeah, for law sure. enforcement, will take what you give it. Yep. You say the exact and same keep thing taking, in the yeah. army. They it'll take, it'll, it'll take what you give it. If, yep. if you give, if you give exactly what they're asking for, then that's, then they'll take it. Mm -hmm. If you want to give 20% more, they'll take it. They'll take a hundred percent of yep. what you were willing yeah, right. to give them. Yep. And yep. most of the time, unless you find someone who's recognizes that you are more involved than you should be at work, no one's going to notice. Sure. Right. No one notices. Right. Yeah. So, um, it's, it's up to you. And, and now th this is me like 10, 10, 12 years ago. Now we do a better job of recognizing yeah. that people are spending too yep. much time at work sure. or they're not devoting enough time to, uh, sure. to activities outside of work. So sure. that's actually one of the things that I enjoy most about, uh, my position as the, as a Sergeant in, at the Sheriff's office, the sergeants, the, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a patrol supervisor. So I'm a, I'm a frontline supervisor. So I'm the la I'm the highest rank that still works in a patrol car and still works out in the patrol, in, in patrol. As soon as you promote up to a mm -hmm. lieutenant and any higher, you're now, in, you work in the office now. And so you just sort of naturally become detached. Mm -hmm. And so one of the reasons I love my position the most is because I just, I have the most influence. My position, my, my rank has the most influence at the sheriff's mm -hmm. office. Um, and I, have the most contact with the most people mm -hmm. at the sheriff's office. And so I get to see that. Sure. I get to see who's spending a ton of time here, who's getting here way earlier than they should be and right. staying way later than they should. Right. And even talking with like, I, I love, I, I patrol, I supervise patrol, but I also have my canine team. I'm also the canine team supervisor. So I'm really close with these guys. And those are the ones that I'm most responsible for. And it's been very important to me that they spend time with their families and that yeah. when we come to work, we're not just talking about work. They're telling right. us about this time that they spent right. with their kids. You know, right. what, what did you get to do yeah. with your, your yeah. wife this week? Yeah. And so we share stories about our yeah. families that, um, that, and that's, I think that's, it's really important. Right. Absolutely. No, Absolutely. hundred yeah, percent. That's huge. Well, we've, we've got a lot of, uh, folks in the military who are fans of the work that you and radar do on social media. So, uh, I'd, I'd hear it if I didn't ask you some questions <laughs> sure. about, about, sure. uh, radar and, and your work to, um, the Sergeant or first Sergeant, uh, Holden was talking about this too. The, the formula is, is really effective and, and really positive too. So it's no, no surprise that it resonates right. with people. Um, so some questions uh, for radar, you, you rate, uh, every snack. And so, well, first of all, I guess if, if any of our listeners haven't gone on Instagram or, uh, one of the other platforms and seen, seen you guys, they need to check it out, but you, you rate every snack for the crunch, the drool factor, et cetera. What's the, what's the highest rated snack that you've tried? Uh, I, I think it was a burrito. We, we had, uh, when we we're on a SWAT operation or really inner operation where we don't get to leave, and the sheriff's office will provide some food for us. Someone, someone went to a local uh, Mexican food place and got some really some really good burritos. And so Radar and I shared a burrito, and he he was taking burrito right out of my mouth. Uh, I, I think that I think that was the highest. The, the rankings are a little arbitrary. I mean, they they're not completely arbitrary, but for the for the most part. Well, I think that's uh, great. The, the rankings are a little bit arbitrary, right? But uh, they're they're fun, and they sort of mimic, uh, a, you know, how much radar I, I appeared to enjoy the snack. Yeah. But the numbers don't they don't really mean a ton. But uh, it, anything, it's it's usually any hot food 
for him. I mean, we'll, he loves opening a bag of chips and eating yeah. some chips or, you know, whatever. But anytime I get hot food, like a French fries or a, a burger or something straight from, straight from sure. a, a restaurant, that he he goes he goes ballistic. I wonder if the smell uh, maybe. Oh yeah, well the smell that, he can yeah. I I can hear him whining before I even get in the car. He knows <laughs> yeah, that that's coming. That's coming. Yeah. Yeah. But he also oh, knows the sound of a you know like any dog he knows the sound of a bag of chips opening or yep. sure you know something like that. But sure. Yeah. yeah. Is his uh, reward for a bust uh, always a McDonald's cheeseburger? It's always a burger. A burger. Yeah. Okay. It kind of just depends on where we go. I've only filmed the cheeseburger. The McDonald's burger was the only one I've I've done. Uh, of filming a, a cap we call it i call it a capture burger he gets a capture burger that's awesome and then uh, i know he doesn't like peeled bananas which is crazy because my dog as soon as he knows the routine uh, as soon as i walk to that part of the kitchen he's 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 uh honed in on it um although i have seen radar eat a salad is there anything else that uh radar won't eat not yet no he'll he'll eat banana now too um, even, even peeled. He's still, I, I sort of have to break off a piece and hand it to him. Yeah. He hasn't yet just taken a bite of a full peeled banana. He has taken a bite of a banana that's with a peel. For some reason, he's okay with taking a bite of a, a banana with a peel on it. Oh yeah. I've seen my dog eat brown banana peels yeah. off the street. So, yeah. oh yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Belly, belly, belly but we haven't, belly. I haven't found anything yet. Not he, the, he everything I've offered him, he's eaten. Nice. Then, uh, so one of our public affairs guys asked, uh, is there a lot of editing that goes into it or do you use a, a, an app? No, no that? editing for just the, for the snacks. We've done other videos uh, where I've edited some stuff where, you know, we'll try to, you know what, I, I did one where it looked like I took a pair of sunglasses off and threw them up in the air. And then all of a sudden he pops up wearing the sunglasses. That was a bunch of editing. So there's yeah, once yeah. in a while, there's some stuff with editing, mm -hmm. but for the most part, the snack that we take, it's just, I just turn the camera on. I open the door, we eat a snack uh, and I close the cage about 90 seconds later. Um, well, there, there have been maybe five or six times where I've started over because I physically couldn't open the snack. Yeah. And so it wasn't interesting to watch me struggle to open a bag. Right. So yeah. right, right, right. no, no yeah, editing, but exactly I have definitely, right. I've definitely started over. No, that's fair. Then, uh, do you choose all your own music? You've given me some earworms, uh, over the last few months. Yes. I choose yeah. the music. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm not the most, I, I've never been a huge fan of music. I like music. I mean, I'm, I enjoy it, but it, I don't know what all these songs are. It's just that Instagram has an algorithm that's just absolutely perfect for picking music and they, they make it very easy. And so I generally, if I don't have an idea of a song in my head already, sometimes I'll get an idea of a song to use just by scrolling through social media. But generally what I do is based on the, the snack I have, I'll throw some keywords into Instagram and it'll just give me a slew of options okay. and I'll, and I'll pick them. And it, I, we were talking about earlier about the the simplicity of the videos and the consistency of them. I try to I try to pair songs that have some sort of a beat drop that when I open the gate and he yeah. pops his head out, that yep. the song the the beat changes at that moment. Yeah. And a lot of people don't recognize it, oh, but it's, it's something that you oh, yeah, can, I've seen it. Yeah. It's something that if once it's pointed out to you, it's yep. like, oh, okay, I see that and I hear it yeah. now. But if you're not paying attention, it's just subconsciously it's just an attractive thing to hear yeah. or to see. So yeah, I think it. I think I first noticed it with uh, Christmas with Run DMC. Yeah, that was that was perfect. Mm -hmm. that, that, was, that was perfect. Well, so uh, we know Radar likes to eat, and well, we know soldiers do too. But uh, we don't always have uh, a whole lot of choice. <laughs> in, in oh my goodness! So uh, well, and this is it's not the it's not the brown bag that you usually see. Okay. Uh, but true true story, I went in my garage and looked at my deployment boxes okay. for an MRE, and this is the only one I could find. It was in my, uh, it was in my okay. go, in my go bag. So um, we'll we'll see. Uh, this is the. And the names are great. Uh, rib shaped barbecue flavor pork patty <laughs> with okay. car caramel powder and smoke flavor added. So yeah. just don't look at the it's ingredients. That sounds yeah. perfect. Uh, and there's probably something else you can that find sounds, in there for yeah, reasons. It's not a veggie. <laughs> that sounds absolutely perfect. It's not a veggie omelet. That's, That's what you don't want. Oh, okay. those, were, right. those were awful. Those. Well, this sounds oh, absolutely those. perfect. We're, he's, I guarantee he's going to eat it and he's going to love it. And I'll, I will also try it. <laughs> That's great. There's probably something for both of you in there. That's great. All right. Well, so you touched on this a little bit already too. We like, 
to use the expression that uh, leaders are readers. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm always curious if there are any particular books that you've listened to recently or podcasts that, that you listen to or follow that you would uh, recommend or share broadly. So I, I wish I was more of a reader. Uh, I, I, I know the importance of it. it I, I listen to a lot of books, mostly Stephen King. And so I don't know if you can throw that in the That's leadership right. column, but, um, <laughs> but I think one, one of the, for, for me, one of the, the point where I made the transition of starting to understand, um, talk to starting to understand how important it was for me to pay attention to my resilience was, uh, there's a guy, Kevin Go Martin's book, um, emotional survival, emotional survival for law enforcement mm -hmm. was really okay. good. And that sort of set me on a path for actually putting it in my mind to think about how important it was. And the, one of the better thing, one of the best things about that book is it's also a good book for family to read. So officers read it and then we hand it to our wives or spouses okay. and say, all right, I need you to read this too, because it explains a lot of what I'm going to go through that I can't necessarily mm -hmm. explain to you. Oh yeah. So yeah. Emotional survival for law enforcement yeah, that's uh, a great was, book. Was, was really good. Yep. Um, I'm reading, uh, I just started reading, uh, Jocko Willink's new leadership book. I don't have a lot to say about it yet. Cause I yeah, just yeah. started extreme reading ownership. It. Yeah. Or, okay. Uh, extreme yeah. leadership. It's something it, the leadership, there's leadership in the title. I apologize. I can't remember that quite the, remember the name of the book, but, uh, his, his new book on leadership. So one of my, uh, team commanders just handed it to me recently. So I'm reading it right now. Yeah. yeah. So I don't have anything to say on it just That's yet. all right. That's all right. Uh, well, yeah. the, the people, cause I, you know, share thoughts at the beginning of meetings and stuff all the time. So yeah. people around me know that I'm a big Jocko. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, and then, uh, Simon Sinek, uh, a motivational speaker and yes. he, he, his book, uh, uh, start with why. Yep. Was, was really good. And I recommend that to, I mean, law enforcement and then anyone outside of law enforcement, uh, just to focus you on why, you know, what is your reason? What is your motivation? Because it, your, your motivation for why you're doing what you're doing is going to lead you to what you're passionate about and wh mm -hmm. where, where your passions lie. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about that all the time at, at the sheriff's office and, and, in canine work. And it's like, why, why are you here? Why do you want to do this? That's the foundation. Yeah. The foundation is, is why. Uh, and so, uh, that, that's something that I pay attention to as a supervisor and, and as a it's supervisor, like a Sergeant, I'm, I'm a leader in, in name, but I'm also, you know, a leader in by nature. And so mm -hmm. I enjoy helping people understand that it, it really goes a long way to understand what your motivation is for, for why you want to do something or why you want to be somewhere. Yeah. And we, uh, I, I love that book too. And talk, talk about that a lot in the military and in helping the people around you see the purpose and meaning in what they do. Cause I'm sure law enforcement is the same way. There's a lot of stuff we do in the military. That's just, it's not fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, it can be, it can be very boring sometimes mm -hmm. and, and it'll take you away from your, from your loved ones for, for long stretches. But if you understand your why, I mean, even if, uh, you know, even if a soldier just finds himself sweeping the floor, uh, in the armory after a drill mm -hmm. weekend, you know, that's not very exciting, but if there's a, a better understanding of the purpose and meaning for what they're doing in uniform, why they're wearing the uniform to mm -hmm. begin with and, and what that, what that flag on mm -hmm. your shoulder stands for, mm -hmm. then, then people can, can embrace even those other more mundane moments. Mm -hmm. Shane, any, any follow-ups? No, I think it's great. I think, uh. I mean, we're thankful for those of you that have stepped up and answered the call to be out there mm -hmm. um, and taking it a step further, right, to test and get in shape and test for these specialized units and and spend time with the dog and, and your family as well. And, and, and you know, oftentimes the families get um, sometimes kind of placed over here. They are the backbone, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The wife and the kids and those that support you. And it's the same in the military. You know, we, they focus so much on those of us, you know, you, they go down range and and, and uh, in different assignments and, and, and those kind of things. But, man, our wives, our wives and our significant others, our partners, our kids, they're huge. They play a huge yeah, role. Yeah. And uh, and so I, I'm, I'm thankful that you're out there, man. I'm thankful for you and what you do. Well, thank you. Appreciate and, it. Uh, and keep up the great work. And and, uh, and I'm excited to kind of see see what uh, the next step is in this interview with uh, – with radar, so yeah, Eamon, thanks so much for spending time with us today, and and just uh, 
uh, echoing what Shane said, uh, grateful for you and, and the people that you work with and, and, and serve with. So God, God bless you and your family and, and everything that you do to, to keep our communities safe. And, uh, and you and Radar too, the, the, the time you're putting in to, to share a little bit of joy with the world as well. Mm -hmm. well I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. And now, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's go out and meet Radar and, uh, maybe, let's go meet maybe, Radar. maybe feed him. He'll take it. Are you guys ready? We're, we're, we're going. So he's going to, when he pops out, he's probably going to say hi to you, but he's going to be so focused on the food that mm. it might not even matter that you're there. All right. So we're filming. We got a show. I guess guys will probably understand what this is. Some, some will, right? It doesn't have the distinctive brown bag that they should. Hopefully they can read that. Open it up. Let this guy out. Hi. Rib shaped. He doesn't care. Hold on, I get some. Oh, come on, man. He gets so focused on the food. Time's up. Time's up. Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. This podcast is produced by the Oregon National Guard Public Affairs Office. My prayer for you is that wherever you find yourself, that you might find hope for today and strength for the ambiguity and chaos of life. Blessings on the rest of your day.